joining us today. Uh, I'm sure it's not the most positive reason why you're here, but nevertheless, we're we're happy that you're here, and uh, we're hoping to make this as valuable valuable as we can for you today. Um, my name is Eric Preston, uh, Senior Vice President of Property and Casualty here at Keenan. Joining me today uh, as panelists are Brian Ardelli, the head of our I Am Ready department here at Keenan, Bill Clayton, the director within I Am Ready, and Eric Olson, senior advisor of I Am Ready. We have an awful lot of information to get through today, so we're going to start right into it. Uh, and first and foremost, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that um, you know this is this is a safe environment, no pun intended. Uh, this is brand new for everyone. This is new for a lot of you. And so it's okay to not quite know exactly uh, where you're at or what to do or or how you're possibly going to get this done by July 1st. Uh, so again, we're we're hoping that this will give you at least a little bit further down that path than you than you were uh, prior to joining this webinar. So in the spirit of that, we thought we'd start by just asking a question and just to, to try to get a sense of where everyone's at in the process of developing their workplace violence prevention plan. Kind of what we expected. Uh, most of you at least are aware of what this is and and know that you've got to do something, but uh, you're here to learn a little bit more. And so that's that's what we're hoping, hoping to achieve here today. Uh, and for, for everyone else, I hope you get something out of this. Uh, and again, if you're if you're not even sure where you're at, um, this we're going to give you a lot of information overload, so you'll definitely know where to go moving forward. All right, so high level, we're going to talk about SB 553. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the actual plan, but we're going to spend the bulk of the time today talking about how do you actually identify your violence-related exposures in the workplace, and then more importantly, how do you go through the process of identifying and implementing control measures for violence-related exposure in the workplace. Then we'll, we'll close out by walking through a scenario, just try to apply what we learned today, and then we'll, we'll share how you can get a bunch of resources from us at the very end. So uh, obviously we're all here because there's a new law. So Senate Bill 553 came out. It is now a compliance driven requirement as employers in California. But the reality is it's not just a check the box compliance plan. This is the reality of the world we live in today uh, that you know violence is a part of our day to day lives in one way, shape or form. And it is a, a part of, of our working environment in one way, shape or form. And so our ultimate goal of, of, of talking with you about this today is to really em help empower you and help empower your employees so that when they do encounter violence in the workplace or violence in general, that they feel more equipped on how to respond to that and how to ultimately protect themselves from violence. So SB 553, uh, this is a new law, a Senate bill that was passed uh, towards the end of 2023. And uh, it's about four pages in length in terms of the actual workplace violence and the plan element of it. But in a super brief nutshell, it requires almost every employer in California to have a workplace violence prevention plan and implemented by this July 1st. Uh, and so that's not very far away. Um, it is very similar in nature to uh, the, your injury and illness prevention plan. It's very similarly worded. It has similar components in terms of what the plan must entail. And in fact, you are uh, allowed to uh, include it in your IIPP if you want. You don't have to, it can be a standalone plan as well. There are pros and cons to both approach, but ultimately the decision is yours. Um, one of the unique things that's a, about this is that this is a safety requirement. And normally safety requirements come through as Calosha regulations. Uh, this one is a little bit backwards. This one started as a law and in this law, it actually has a requirement that Cal OSHA develop supporting regulations but they, they have another two years to do that. So they're supposed to have something uh, ready for approval by, I think it's December of 2026. But you all have an obligation to have something in place by this July. So this is definitely a backwards approach than what we're typically used to from a safety perspective. Um, what that ultimately means is that you have to do your best to meet what the letter of the law says. And in the meantime, as Calosha develops its, its workplace violence regulations, we're going to have to then reevaluate and and modify our plans to meet whatever those new regulations dictate that we have to have in our plan and how we go about it. So it's a little bit of a cart before the horse, but nevertheless, um, you know, after two years, we'll all sit back and, and think of how wonderful this time was where we had to figure it out on our own. Um, another unique element of this requirement is that this is not a check the box compliance plan. Um, this plan, if you read through the text, which is something you can do if you can't sleep at night, but it's something that is uh, they're very adamant in multiple parts of the of the law that this plan must be developed 
with the effective engagement of your staff and or their representatives. This is something that you have to build specific to the input from your working force. Uh, your training must be built with the engagement of your staff and union representatives. So what that really means is that your plan is going to be very specific to you and your your workplace and your occupations. Um, this is not going to be one of those things where you can just download a template, check some boxes, and call it a, a compliant plan. That did not involve any employee engagement. So that's not going to happen. And you're also not going to find or shouldn't find a quote-unquote compliant SB 553 training because, again, this, the, the law requires that you develop your training with the engagement and involvement of your staff. So um, there's going to be a lot of customization in this one compared to what we're typically used to. And the third reason why this is a little bit more unique is that your plan is going to have to be really specific to each occupation and the exposures faced by each occupation. Um, if you think of a normal kind of a safety compliance plan like bloodborne pathogens, the bloodborne pathogen is the exposure, so it doesn't really matter which occupation has that exposure. The exposure is the same as blood or, or bodily fluids. This is very different. You know, a, a custodian working at a facility at night has very different potential exposures to violence than a delivery truck driver or a law enforcement officer. And so the control elements that you implement for each of those, it has to be very specific to each of those occupations. So what does the actual plan require? So you have to have a written plan. It, it has uh, about nine, nine different elements. I'm going to briefly go through these. We will make a template plan available to you all at the end of this uh, training. Again, it's a framework. It's not a check the box plan, but it will guide you through each of these elements and, and give uh, ideas of how best to fulfill the intent of what that element of a plan is asking for. So the first one is fairly straightforward. Uh, you have to identify a person that's responsible for the plan. And so this is a name and or a title. Uh, our recommendation is, of course, have someone that has the authority to work with others within your, your workforce to, to get the engagement of your employees. That doesn't mean that this person has to be the one that does all the work, but they definitely have to be the one that can rally the troops, uh, for lack of better words, to work with each department, each occupation, and get that implementation and, and, and uh, involvement of the employees. The second element is, is getting right into... Uh, how are you going to involve those employees? So the very second part of this plan, you have to dictate how you're going to get that active engagement from your workforce. And again, this is a little bit different than what we're used to with a normal safety compliance plan. So you've got a lot of options. You can do meetings, you can do task force, you can do safety committees, you can do surveys, you can do whatever means that you think is going to be the most effective in getting that engagement from your employees and having them provide feedback as to what what exposures they think they have in their occupations and the control measure they think might work best to protect them uh, in the workplace from violence related exposures. But the third element is coordination. So as much as there's a requirement for you as an employer to do a lot of work, there's also a requirement that employees have to be involved in too. And so you have to tell how you're gonna coordinate everybody in this process. What are the, what is the plan administrator's responsibilities? What are the employee's responsibilities? What are supervisor responsibilities? And how are you going to make sure that you're communicating with all parties involved so that everyone understands their role and the plan can be implemented effectively? Uh, the fourth element is really the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about here today. And that's the, the process by where you're going to, you're going to define your procedures and your process for how you accept reports of workplace violence from your employees. And then more importantly, how do you evaluate and respond to those reports that you receive. That's the whole goal here, right? We, we, want, we, want, uh, we want employees to, to share what concerns they have related to workplace violence, and we need the employer to be engaged in evaluating them, investigating them, and then con figuring out what control methods are the best, uh, the most effective way to control that source of violence. So that's what this section of the plan is really all about. Uh, section five is similar to an IAPT. Again, employers have an obligation to at least employees, excuse me, have an obligation to try to at least follow what the plan says and and follow what their requirements are and their responsibilities are as you've defined in the plan. And so really this just means is that you're going to tell everyone how you're going to do that. How are you going to make sure employees are actually uh, engaged and following what you've said is in the plan? This really doesn't need to be very detailed. It really could be whatever your existing disciplinary action uh, plan is for non-compliance with employee, employer policies. Uh, I, your IPP has a similar requirement, so this is nothing really new from that, that regard. Uh, number six is employee communication. Again, it's just uh, this is where the, 
the law is very specific in the types of information that they want your employees to report to you when it comes to workplace violence related incidents or threats. Um, lots of very specific information and, and categorization of information that they want you to gather um, for record keeping purposes that we'll talk about in a few minutes, as well as ultimately to then respond and, and implement more controls as you start seeing trends. So as, you, as you'll, you'll notice uh, in the sample template and in the form itself, they categorize the types of violence, they categorize the conditions, they want to make it trendable analytics so that you can make use of the information and continually uh, evolve your plan. Uh, the next uh, requirement is very similar to that one. It's now that you've received that information from your employers, well, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to evaluate it? And then more specifically, how are you going to respond to it? So again, it's just you defining those procedures. What investigations are you going to do? Who's on point? Who's going to be involved? What's the turnaround time? How are you going to communicate to the person you reported it? What your response was? And ultimately, what we're going to talk about today, what are those response options? What? How do you actually control violence uh, as much as possible? Uh, the next section in our template, by the way, has a sample workplace violence reporting form already in there. So that part has uh, more late work done for you. Uh, and then the, the last parts are, are training and record keeping. So training is, is not to understate it, but it is its own uh, animal because, again, this is not just a check the box training. You have to do really two core elements for training. You have to train your employees on your plan. So what does your plan say you're going to do? about workplace violence. That's one component. The other component is what are the specific violence related exposures and control measures that each occupation needs to be trained on. And so this is where each training is going to be a little bit different. Again, your, your night custodians might need certain trainings for their exposures. Your law enforcement offers are going to need very different types of trainings to allow them to control and protect themselves from violence. And so it's not it, in a vision of, of one totality of a training, it's lots of individual modules that are going to be layered differently depending on the occupation group and their exposures. And that's really a great way to kind of transition to Bill and in talking to, to how do we make this effective? How do we actually go from having a plan to actually having an, a, a, a good process for investigating and responding to uh, violence in the workplace? So Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Eric. And, and you know, as you were discussing this, it, it just, I pictured this, uh, this picture of Earth. And if you think of the, uh, the Earth now, it's kind of like the government saying, I want you to go to the center of the Earth. And oh, by the way, you're here at the service, but we don't really tell you how to get there, but you need to get there. And to me, that's a little bit what we've done with uh, SB 553. So using that sort of as a, an analogy or a metaphor, Picture uh, SB 553 as being the core, and all of those layers are things that we want to consider as we uh, as we look at this plan. You know, whether it's eliminating the violence, uh, you know, how do we do that, uh, and some of those other things. So, what we're going to do throughout the rest of this uh, time together is we're going to look at some of those different layers uh, and controls. The, the, you know, SB 553 gives um, they they type workplace violence by defining people, which is, it's kind of interesting to do, but I, I'm not sure in the end what that really does for us in, in actually preventing violence. But here is where they're looking at that. What they're looking at first is, is it committed by a person who has no legitimate purpose at the website? They should not even be there, and yet they're committing workplace violence. The second category or type is a person, they, they do, uh, have a legitimate purpose or reason of being there uh, for whatever reason, uh, but they're con they're committing violence when they're there. The third one is by a present or former employee, and I know that's probably one of those ones we go to quite often. We think about workplace violence, but it could be a former employer, a supervisor, manager, any of those. And then the fourth type is those committed by a person who does not work at the workplace. Uh, but he uh, he or is known, he or she is known to have uh, maybe had a relationship with somebody there similar to, uh, you, you know, an estranged spouse or something like that coming in. So we're going to look at the, the first part of this in prevention. It's, it's fine to look at the types of people that's really good for analytics, for 
for tracking and all those kinds of things. But as we've discussed this, we look at those things that's, that are going to happen as actual criminal acts of violence. Could be threats of violence, an actual physical attack, uh, a sexual assault or rape, robbery, not necessarily burglary, uh, carjacking, uh, high value items, abortion, I'm sorry, abduction, kidnapping, uh, murder and manslaughter. Those are all different types of things uh, that are that are criminal acts. They're um, offenses. So, um, yeah, any anything that those four types of people might commit. Yeah, and Bill, just to that point again, that the the plan itself is very high level in that they you know they're saying it identified as one of those four types, right? But but really, as you start building those layers, like you referred to earlier, um, you know, to be more effective, you gotta try, you gotta think about the violence in terms of the 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 um the type of violence not necessarily the type of person who's doing it so we're not saying don't do that because you have to for the law but to be more effective you need to go a little bit deeper one layer deeper to also consider the the actual sources of violence and the categories of violence that those people are doing so those types one two three or four add on this next layer of of those to help you further detail the types of controls that you're ultimately going to implement right to help, help you prevent them <laughs> Good morning, folks. We're going to discuss the next level is to understand where and when these criminal acts of violence might occur. This is going to help allow you to align employee job duties with these exposures. Now, SB 553 wants you to consider at least the following areas of location environment. Location being in the workplace, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Now, back to your environment. Was the employee completing usual job duties? Was the area poorly lit? Was the employee being rushed with their duties? Was there a low staffing level? Was the employee isolated or alone? Were they able to get help or assistance? Was the employee working in a community setting? And were they working in an unfamiliar or new location? Continuing on, uh, SB 553 blends environmental conditions with locations. A more effective approach that Keenan feels is appropriate is to expand on these two topics separately to identify more specific controls. The next level is to understand where and when these criminal acts of violence might occur. This is going to allow you to align job, employee job duties with these exposures, such as high valued items, money, technological uh, equipment, uh, crime statistics in your area, a mobile workforce is the employee driving, isolated from assistance or uh, a response, public use space or places with public interaction or areas, restricted areas within a location. Continuing on with this uh, prevention topic, we're going to discuss the time of day, working alone, lighting, whether it's indoors or outdoors, weather and acts of God, civil disturbance, uh, not a peaceful protest, Fluctuate, fluctuations in levels of cash and money, you know, whether you're at a football game or any type of fundraiser, and the mental health of yourself, your peers, uh, students, and the public. Uh, we feel uh, combinations of specific exposures may cause you to utilize different control measures. Take, for instance, hot weather typically brings out uh, more people, and along with that, a criminal element. You layer that over um, an employee's exposure to working at night, possibly alone, uh, will cause you to um, have to uh, realign your exposures and your control measures. Great, thank you very much, Eric. And and you know to your point, this that's what that's really what we're trying to to build here is is as much as you have to have a plan and you have to have very specific elements of the plan. What we're really striving for is to be as effective as you can in protecting employees, right? And so we're trying to build in, as Bill alluded to earlier, as many layers of control as you can. And it's important to understand what the sources are of violence and the combination of those factors that Eric talked about, because those various combinations are going to ultimately lead to different control measures. And so it's not just, again, it's not just a one and done. It's not just saying custodians have this exposure or law enforcement has that exposure. It's all dependent on all of those factors, which it's, it sounds like a lot of work, and it, it is. Um, and it sounds a little bit daunting, but it's also a way for you to get very, very honed in on what the most effective ways to control workplace violence are. 
And again, that goes back to the beginning that we talked about earlier. Your plan needs to be very specific to your conditions, to your occupation, where they work, when they work, what does the surrounding environment look like? And so that's going to be different from employer to employer, even if you're in the same industry, even if you're all K-12 or community college or cities or water agencies, they're, they're, no two are alike. And so you're going to have very different different uh, combinations of those variables, which is ultimately going to lead to different combinations of controls. So bring the, this back into the, okay, great. Now that I've scared the crap out of everyone, what do we do about all this, right? How do we actually make this work? And so this is all about managing this type of a risk and this type of an exposure. And so for those of you who are, are familiar with risk management, you're probably familiar with this, this inverted pyramid here. Uh, this is the NIOSH uh, hierarchy of controls. And this is a great process. It's a great kind of a, a workflow to go through as you evaluate what your control options are for each of those varying exposures. And the reality is, is, is you know, ideally you implement as many as you can. But in workplace violence specifically, it's very hard to check all the boxes. So you do as much as you can. So the way that this works, and, and just so that we can understand for those who are not familiar with this, is we want to start from the top. Ideally, when we're trying to talk about controlling workplace violence, the first option is, can we eliminate it outright, right? And so I'm, we're going to walk through this in a minute, but let me, let me apply a, a scenario that you may be more familiar with that we've kind of worked through recently, which was COVID-19, the pandemic. And so if we take the COVID-19 as our exposure in this case, how would we work through this workflow just so we can understand this concept? So it, the first layer, the most effective being, can we eliminate COVID-19? And at, at the end of the day, back in, in COVID-19, the answer was no. COVID-19 was a, a human-driven source of, of, of safety or illness. And so unless you're going to eliminate employees from your workplace uh, and or any humans from your workplace, excuse me, not even employees, Elimination really wasn't an option. Now, working from home was a, a, a substitution of that or an engineering control around that, but it, you couldn't truly eliminate it. So that was very, very challenging. So going down that next level, if you can't eliminate it, can you substitute it? So that's you're substituting one risk for another risk. So again, using COVID-19 as our working example, this would be kind of akin to, all right, we're not going to have humans in our workplace. We're going to have robots, right? So we still need people doing our jobs, but we're going to substitute, substitute the hazard for someone who can't something that can't con 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 convey or transmit that that particular uh, source of, of ha a hazard or exposure. So again, substitution wasn't super, super effective for COVID-19. So we go down to the third layer, uh, which was engineering controls. Now, this is where you started seeing a lot of potential control measures. So think of an engineering control as a mechanical, uh, a mechanical control of the, the exposure. So, um, in, in COVID-19, these were things like those, those plexiglass uh, barriers you saw between a cashier and a customer. That was a physical engineering control to try to block that hazard from the employee working. Um, uh, another engineering control um, would be something like um, uh, a, a sound barrier in a high noise uh, machine room. So you're going to put a physical barrier around this machine to make the noise slightly less loud. So you're, 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 phys you're physically installing something to try to control that source of violence. Going down the pyramid, uh, the next one being administrative controls. So these are more kind of policies, procedures, behaviors, things that you're going to do to try to manage that exposure. So again, during COVID-19, we saw a lot of administrative controls. We saw, um, you know, staggering work hours. We saw re reduction in workforce. We saw uh, people being physically, you know, um, told told to stay out of a room for 15 minutes or 24 hours. We saw lots of reporting administrative control to try to protect employees. So these are those those policies, those procedures, uh, plans, for lack of better words, that you would implement to try to con to try to control that exposure. And then last, but and and really not least, is PPE. So if there's nothing else you can do to pro protect an employee from whatever that exposure is. The last layer of defense is blocking that person from the source. So PPE is things like well, for COVID-19, that was the masks. Um, those were the face shields. So now you're putting something on the person to protect them from that hazard, from that source of, of, of safety exposure. So that was just kind of an example to help you understand what how this process works. So now I'm going to turn over to Brian to try to walk through applying this hierarchy of controls 
to the world of workplace violence and what control measures do you have in each of these buckets? So, Brian? Thank you, Eric. When we look at available control measures and we take into account those fundamentals of risk management and, and the inverted period that illustrates that, we see obviously the most effective one is gonna be elimination. Unfortunately, elimination, when, when we come to uh, reducing the potential for workplace violence, especially in schools and public sectors, there's not a whole lot of application for elimination. We can't eliminate our public. We can't eliminate the, the infrastructure. We can't get rid of our students and our staff and things like that. So um, that effectively becomes not very effective. That kind of takes us down to the next option, which is um, substitution. And here you have a couple options, but not many. Um, the ones that come to mind are most commonly seen by us are things like substituting cash transaction points and those types of things that are, are uh, historically high risk, um, high risk actions or, or, or things like that with OSHA. We can substitute those for things like electronic tr fund transfers, credit card payments, things like that. Outside of that, not a whole lot of stuff in substitution either. Um, that kicks us down to engineering. And I was happy to see in the poll that Bill ran that the bulk of the responses came back to engineering and administrative controls. And this is where we typically see the most meet when we're out doing assessments for clients, trying to help them identify those vulnerabilities, especially the ones tied back to workplace violence. So, you know, here we're looking at things that typically tie back to site hardening. And those are things like fencing and gates and locks, ballistic film, uh, camera, security guards, all those things that make the site safer through these kind of physical elements. And um, what we will typically see looking down one from there, if we look at administrative control, what we'll typically find is clients are usually good at putting a lot of control measures in place um, and then not having the engineering controls to make sure they're being used properly. So here we might have things like really good door locks or, uh, you know, nice perimeter fencing around ours, or if it's a school site or something like that, but then we find the gates aren't being locked. And so the administrative management of that makes that, that, that control measure, that engineering control measure really ineffective because it's not being administratively controlled. Um, so here with these two, which were the bulk of what you guys responded to in, in your webinar, you're probably going to get the most bang for your buck here, but also you're going to have to be careful to make sure if that we're doing, putting in the proper administrative controls to make those engineering controls effective. We look down past that to PPE at the bottom of that triangle. And what we find, there's not a whole lot of application here either when it comes to reduction of workplace violence. The one that comes to mind is if we have um, school security officers or school police officers, maybe things like ballistic vests, ballistic blankets, and things like that. Outside of that, not a whole lot of personal protective equipment that's going to help you reduce workplace violence. So I think what we're going to do to make this, to, to bring this home a little bit, Eric is going to show us a video here in a second. All right, what we're going to see next is a short case study. At the end of that case study, we're going to have a little dialogue. And we're going to pop up another poll. Um, let's go ahead and play the video. Okay, to summarize this case study, uh, what this was, um, was an assailant, the man in the tan jacket. He was the estranged husband of his wife, ex-wife, um, who was a teacher at this particular school. Uh, the gentleman entered the administrative office, signed in for their administrative controls, and was given access inside of the school, uh, to which point he entered 
his estranged wife's classroom, produced a firearm, shot and killed his estranged wife, and unfortunately, one of the projectiles also struck a student, uh, killing that child. Stop him. Tragic, uh, to say the least. Um, we're going to put up a poll. And with that poll, I'd like you to consider uh, the hierarchy or the control layers that best uh, worked in this scenario, if at all. It seems like the overwhelming majority uh, selected administrative and uh, engineering control secondly. Um, I, I would tend to agree. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the uh, panelists. Um, going down through the list of uh, control methods, methods, is there anything that would have allowed us to eliminate this uh, potential uh, threat? You know, this this is a great one, Eric. And and you know, any situation that is unfortunate. You know, the best thing we can do after an unfortunate incident is to try to learn from it, right? And so it, it, for those of you who have never seen this and, and you may not have caught all this, there was a lot that did work well in, in here. And so from an elimination perspective, again, this is a public, a public facing place. You can't, you can't not have humans there. It's very, very difficult to refuse uh, human access to, to a place of education, a public place of education. So I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not seeing an, an awful lot of elimination controls here, Bill Graham. Yeah, I would just say, um, I think because there may be a, an engineering shortfall, or I'm sorry, administrative shortfall more so than engineering, because if you notice, the physical measures they had in place guided him to the place where they wanted him to be. Um, I think where this one falls short is potentially with managing that once he got into that place, how do we decide who gets to come into the site and who does it? Um, so not to say that it looks like they had a sign in there, which is good. There's technology now that allows us to take that to the next level and we can have things like internal databases and things like that to better vet people that are coming to the sites. Um, or we can have policies that say we don't allow folks to sign in and go into the core of our campus. We keep them in a controlled area and we bring our staff members out to them, um, giving that staff member an, an opportunity to you know, bring to their attention their is potentially a problem or something like that. So not to say that anybody did anything wrong. And uh, this occurred in the past when that technology was less prevalent than it is now. But I would say more of an administrative um, shortfall than an engineering shortfall, if I, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, Brian, I, I, I couldn't help but notice. So there was really good perimeter access control. You know, you had mentioned if you have perimeter access control in place, like fencing, but the gates are all open, that doesn't really get everybody in through a single point of entry. It, it worked here. That worked. The fences worked. It guided him toward the office. He tried to get in the double doors. The doors were locked. Single point of entry forced him over the office. So the engineering part worked great. I, I really like that part of it. I, I do agree that where it, where it tended to break down was on the administrative part. And some of it is just, you know, ought to be standard practice for any office area that you don't come in and visit unless you have prior approval uh, from, the, from the organization, from the agency. You don't, you don't come inside to visit with staff. You know, and this, this brings up a really good point is, is, again, we're dealing with humans at the end of the day. Uh, and in this particular scenario, this was not a stranger. This was a, a recognized person. So, not, you know, that was accustomed to being seen on campus on occasion. And, and so it's very, very hard to assume that, that any human is going to do something bad, uh, especially when you know them in, in any way, stretch or, stretch or form, and you know them to be nonviolent, generally speaking. So this is, this is the part that becomes extremely challenging as an employer to, to try to truly prevent, because you, you, you can't know what people are going to do in the future. There's no, there's no way. So the best you can do is to try to implement as many controls, as many of these options as possible to try to manage it and control it to the best of your ability. Um, and, and again, this is this is a, a super unfortunate scenario. There was great control measures in place. We are learning, we're learning now that there are additional controls that you can do to further restrict access, further get information as much as you can. And we're gonna have to constantly adapt. That's just the reality of that. And that's why we wanted to share this video was to just, you know, share that, hey, you know, there are ways that you can control it. The engineering controls work. The administrative controls at the time served, served their purpose, at least to the best of everyone's knowledge. 
and we're adapting. We're implementing more controls, more layers, and that's the whole point here. So, so as long as you're you're in a mindset of, of constantly getting feedback from your employees, evaluating what that feedback is, and responding with uh, modified controls or altered controls, that's really what we think the intent of this is is, is looking for. We're trying to get better than we were yesterday. That's that's the goal. You're never going to prevent all violence. It's just not, that's not realistic. But you can do better than you had prior as an employer. And now you can have a more more formal approach to managing workplace violence as an employer. And so as much as we spent, you know, a lot of today talking about SB 553 and kind of the the actual workplace violence prevention and control measure element, it's probably important to keep in mind that that that's not the the end of the story. So in the unfortunate event that you have a violence related incident, your plan it, it was already kind of there. The, the plan was supposed to protect and respond and keep employees safe. Once that that incident has happened, there's a whole other world that needs to come in here that is outside of SB 553. So we just wanted to take a moment to remind you of what some of those things are that fall outside of 553 and are not part of that specific plan. So Bill, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so when you think about this, you think about things like uh, an emergency operations plan. Every public agency in California uh, is, is, by government code, is supposed to have a, an emergency operations plan. And a lot of this, uh, the, the things that we look at with other plans, none of them specifically address violence in the workplace as it is stated in SB 553. So you have to kind of filter this through and say, okay, so we want to, you know, we want to stop whatever's happening from happening, preserve life. Uh, do we have folks trained in first aid, critical uh, response, uh, you know, criminal mass casualty events? Do have we thought about those things? Uh, what other types of things are going to come into play? Well, because we're talking about a criminal act, are we going to be uh, able to say we uh, preserve the crime scene? We preserved evidence uh, for law enforcement to come in and do their part. So there's a lot of interaction here. It doesn't just happen at a workplace. It involves the entire community. Uh, and then afterwards, are we are we talking together? Are we doing some sort of a hot wash, uh, an after action debrief, so we learn from best practices. That the weird thing about five five three is we're doing this because of what's happened in the past. That's why five five three is there. But they don't tell you what all the best practices are to have this. That's up to OSHA to figure out in the next two years. So what we're saying, there already exists a boatload of stuff on helping you do this but you have to figure out how to put it into place following the requirements of the Senate bill itself. Um, there's probably going to be some things that you have in place that your employees are going to say, let me just give you an example. You're, you're always going to see this. Employees are going to say, you know, I leave after dark and the lighting is not good enough out in the parking lot. Can you do something about that? Well, that's going to have to be addressed. Those types of things are going to have to be addressed in your violence prevention program and, and it's going to put us on notice in a sense that we address it and respond back to employees with that. And even, even though the IIPP is built in with communications back to employees, this is going to be very specific to the violence prevention uh, piece of that. And then is there other things that you have to put in place, any kind of new controls? Do you have to team workers up that have been uh, previously working alone? And all of these things, all of these impacts, uh, they're not, they don't come without some kind of a monetary um, uh, influence on this. They're gonna cost us something uh, as we do this. So just keep these things in mind. And, and the bottom line of this is we really wanna improve our overall resilience. We, you know, we have a surviving an active assailant annex in our emergency operations plan, but it doesn't cover all of this stuff. It doesn't cover all the little bits and pieces here. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be done once the event occurs. The, 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 the bill is about prevent. If it does happen, and it may, what are we going to do after the fact? We have to, we have to keep those things in mind. Right. Thank you, Bill. So we've got, uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions, which is, is great. And I do see a handful of questions already loading up. So we're going to work through as many of these as we can. Um, just for everyone who's on here, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the questions that are submitted today, in addition to the questions that were submitted as part of the registration for this webinar, and we will create a follow-up Q&A document to try to answer as many of those as we can. 
um, or as many of those as our attorney will allow us, which is going to take me to this slide here, of course. Um, so I'm going to do my very best attorney voice to read this disclaimer for you all. Uh, let me just read some things. So uh, disclaimer, Keenan and Associates is an insurance brokerage and a consulting firm. It is not a law firm. We do not give legal advice and neither this webinar presentation, the answers provided during the questions and answer period, nor the documents accompanying this presentation constitutes or should be construed as legal advice. You are advised to follow up with your own legal counsel to discuss how this information affects you. All right, so let me work through some of these questions and I will uh, try to, to ping who I think might be the best person to answer this as we work through these. Um, and so the first one on here is, um, how long was it for Calvin to develop the guidelines? Did I adhere two years? You did hear two years. Um, again, this is the backwards approach. Uh, Kalosha has, uh, I believe, again, I'll double check, is uh, until December of 2026, I know it's 2026 at least, um, to develop and ultimately get approved to propose their regulations. Now, the unique thing about that is that it, they could be proposed and they may have to go back to the drawing board. So reality, we, we don't know exactly when it will be approved, but they have at least two years to come up with their proposal. Uh, for anyone who's participated in kind of an OSHA regulation development uh, process, it's very laborious. Lots of public comments, questions, lots of kind of um, meetings to talk, talk about it, work through it, make adjustments, make red lines. So yes, there's going to be quite a bit of time between when this law says you have to have the plan in place to when we get more specific guidance from Cal OSHA about what has to be in the plan and what steps you have to follow. So it doesn't mean you're off the hook. It just means that you get more flexibility in what your plan says until we get some of those specifics uh, from Cal OSHA. Well, Eric, Eric, kind of to your point, how long did it take for uh, Cal OSHA to come up with a, a solid uh, COVID plan? Well, well, uh, that's a, a unique one because they went they went about that faster than I've ever seen anything out of Cal OSHA come up. But that was because of the nature of the beast. So, but even that, I mean, they were making updates every felt like every day, but it was probably more like every few months, and they were constantly adjusting and 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 uh, kind of amending their own regulations. Uh, to coincide with the, the trends of, of the pandemic, of course. But yeah, so it's, we're going to be flexible here. That's, that's the key. Uh, the next one is, um, to be clear, this is more than just creating a prevention plan regarding training, but also seeking prevention feedback from employees and putting corrective measures into place. That is correct. And um, I, I have the actual regulation text here. Again, I'm not an attorney, so I'm going to read this verbatim. But if, if you listen to the word they use, it, it does it gets get very specific about what they want from your employee engagement. So as part of that element of your plan, it says methods uh, that the employer will use to coordinate, I'm sorry, uh, your plan must have effective procedures to obtain the active involvement of employees and authorized employee representatives in developing and implementing the plan, including but not limited to, through their participation in identifying so it's identifying the exposures, evaluating, meaning evaluating what the exposure is and how what do you do about it, and correcting the workplace violence hazards. So to answer your question directly, yes, they want the employee in, input not just on the plan development, but specifically what are you going to do to protect them from those specific violence-related exposures. And again, that's that has the potential to be daunting, and it's going to take quite a few conversations, a lot of, of conversation with your employees. Uh, next question. Oh, this is a good one. So is uh, F SB 553 different than what is required for workplace violence in the hospitals? So great point. Um, SB 553 is for everyone else who doesn't already have a workplace violence related requirement in which um, workplace uh, hospitals, healthcare is one that already has a violence related uh, requirement. And so this does not apply to that environment. Um, they already have their own and it's already been spelled out through uh, Kalosha regulations. Um, you know, one may say that you could refer to those uh, healthcare related regulations to see what you might expect for uh, for the general workplace violence one, but of course, no, never want to, want to assume anything. Do you have recommended questions for a staff survey? Um, I'm gonna answer what's in here in the law and then I'm gonna open it up to, to the three of you uh, panelists in terms of things that you would recommend or type, types of common feedback you see when you're out working with, with public entities in relation to violence and violence prevention. So on the SB 553 side, in the 
reporting requirements. So remember we talked earlier about there's a requirement that you you have employees report uh, incidents or, or threats of violence. Part of that form and part of the bill is very specific in what type of information they want you to, uh, they want employees to include. So that might be a good starting point in terms of the types of questions to ask your staff, because that's what the bill assumes is the most important, at least. So for example, um, the workplace violence type or types, like we talked about earlier, um, the, uh, the classification of the type of person committing the violence. So a great question could be, what type of, of, of humans do you have exposure to in your workplace? Is it just staff? Is it staff and students? Is it staff and public? Is it um, third party uh, third party employers? So that might be a great question to ask to get you a sense of what types of humans do you have uh, exposure to in terms of the classification in the form. Um, there's other questions on here that they want you to act to put in your reporting form, such as what was the type of attack? Was it a physical attack without a weapon? Was it an attack with a weapon? Was it a threat of an attack or a threat of force with a weapon? Was it a sexual assault or a threat of a sexual assault? Was it an animal attack? Now, I should probably pause here. Animals in and of themselves are not covered in terms of workplace violence. So you, you, this is not something where you need to consider a um, like a raccoon bite or something like that as a workplace violence exposure. Why they say animals in here is that, in at least in theory, if a person is using an animal as a threat of violence and or with the intent to use the animal as the the tool or the weapon for lack of better words then yes then that's what when it would apply under workplace violence so all that to say is it is it is that's a great place to start in terms of the types of questions to engage with your with your employees but i'd like to open it up to to the rest of you to kind of see what the more common questions and concerns you guys see when you're out there doing evaluations I guess for for me, are, are, is the question, how would you build a survey? No, it's like, what types of questions do you ask? Like, you're, you're inviting feedback from employees. What kind of feedback are you looking for? What how, how do you ask the question for, or what their 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 concerns are? Basically, I would say number one uh, complaint would be a lack of training. Um, you know, viable training, especially in the realm. Given you know the recent history and, and uptake of these events is an uh, active assailant type of event, you know which you know automatically dovetails into SB five five three. I, I think um, you know common sense approach to training, realistic training, um, definitely eases um, the, the concerns of a lot of the client base that I've been exposed to. Um, and it, it just it automatically just comes down to you know, budget constraints or, or scheduling constraints. But that that is the number one issue that I I have run into is that lack of training. Well, I, and, I, and I think it's a good point, and, and just building off that a little bit, Eric, the, the, the questions I get when we're doing, for example, a school district-wide surviving an active assailant type training module is I'll often have different occupations come up asking, yes, but in my workplace, this is the condition, what should I do? And, and I think because SB 553 talks about occupations, I, I think it's important to remember you're going to try to sort by occupation, by environment, by all of those things that we just talked about today. So those questions have to be specific to those areas. You can't just ask a general question, what do you think? It has to be something specific that fits into their work environment. And it could be unique. You could have you know, 400 employees and only 10 of them are out in the field by themselves in trucks, for example, and, and like with a water agency, what do they do? Uh, what's their situation going to be? So I, I think you have to think about those things. Yeah, and I'll just say, well said by both of you. I 100% agree with Bill and Eric on that. You know, taking the time to get down to those individual classifications and figuring out what those, what their perceived threats are. Yeah, and and I wanted to touch briefly on on the the comment that Eric made about training. I think the unfortunate reality with this is that a lot of, of your control measures are just going to have to be, you're educating your employees on what to do when violence occurs. Because again, it's very hard to physically prevent it most of the time because they're illegal acts to begin with. So it's very hard to apply uh, legal world rules in an illegal act. So the, a lot of the control measures may be, you're gonna really educate your team on 
whatever variables that, that might affect them in regards to workplace violence. So is it surviving an active assailant? Is it self-defense? Is it situational awareness? Um, just all of those various uh, kind of topics so that they are, again, more empowered to protect themselves whenever that, that violent event does occur. So training will become a, a big element of this, and there's certainly going to be no shortage in, in what you try to train your employees. Uh, we're almost out of time here. Um, I'm going to try to hit on at least one more question. Um, and it actually has to do with training. So the question is, will uh, Keenan Safe Schools, which is our online training program, but I'll apply that to just online training in general, be sufficient to satisfy their training requirement? And the answer is yes and no. So you can use online training. You can use some elements of what is already on Keenan Safe Schools and probably what is already on a lot of different online learning modules. But there's not going to be a single source training because, again, your training needs to be developed very specifically with the input of your employees. And it needs to be very specific to each of the occupations that you have and the exposures unique to those occupations. So even within your own employee workforce, you know, you'll have one category of employees who may get training on the plan and working with public. You may have another category of employees who get training on the plan and working remotely and active assailant and uh, civil dis disturbance and self-defense. They're just, again, they're all kind of modules that you're going to want to kind of build on based off of what those exposures are as identified through those conversations and engagement you have with your employees. So there's going to be lots of options available as long as you're building it right and you're you're addressing all of the feedback from your employees. That's, that's what is going to make a quote-unquote compliant plan is based on your specific exposures. So unfortunately, we are just about out of time for this. Again, we will create a follow-up Q&A um, that we will make available to everybody uh, after the webinar. Uh, give us a, a few days. We've got quite a few questions still coming in. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to take some time to respond to those uh, formally. Uh, in the meantime, we also have resources available that we will be, uh, make available to you. We have a workplace violence prevention plan uh, template framework. Again, it's going to help you build your custom plan. We also have a, a template record keeping law that you can use to record keep and track what is required from the plan. Uh, we will make available for you a hazard threat assessment survey that you can use as, as trying to identify what your hazards are and what your threats might be. We will share um, a threat and physical security assessment checklist. So again, kind of a high level, what do you look for? How do you identify potential exposures? And then from our perspective, there's, it's great to have a plan, but as Brian mentioned early, earlier, it doesn't do anything unless you actually administratively use your controls. So we'll, we'll share a tabletop drill scenario that you can uh, work through exercising your plan to see if it works. If it doesn't work, what you need to modify, what might need to be improved uh, moving forward. So again, thank you all very much for your time today. We appreciate you spending your hour with us this morning. Hopefully you found this information useful and we will be following up with you shortly. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.